This is the Push Shift Podcast, a raw look at the hospitality industry. What is happening, Push Shift Podcast, and welcome to another episode of the Push Shift Podcast. Um, I'm in my second season now, which is fantastic. Uh, I topped off my first season with 100 episodes. That's sort of what I'm looking at, is that I'm going to be doing uh, one season and 100 episodes, including the Push Shift shots. So my 100th episode was with the incomparable Jeffrey Morgan Thaler. So if you haven't heard that one yet, you really should go back and listen. Um, this week, uh, I, this is keep sort of going with the Victoria Whiskey Fest. I did a whole bunch of podcasts uh, last month or a month and a half ago now um, with the whiskey, uh, while the Whiskey Fest was in town. And this one's with Taylor Corrigan, who is the uh, Canadian American whiskey brand ambassador, but mainly he focuses on Old Forester and Woodford Reserve. But um, he's an old friend of mine, so it was a really good opportunity to sit down and chat to him and sort of just just, just chew the curd about uh, American whiskey and how he fell into it. So I hope you enjoy this episode, guys. Thanks a lot for the support, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. I was on a radio show a few months ago, and we're, we're like out of time. And the host was like, well, this has been great. Um, and I realized like he hadn't asked me anything. He was like, we've got to wrap up now. And I was like, okay, great. I did City Line, I did City Line years ago. Um, and I was on with, um, oh, what's his name? Chef out of Toronto has his place in, is it, it's not Massimo. It's, uh, yeah, it's Massimo. No, it's not Massimo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it Massimo? Yes. Uh, yeah. Who's got the mustache? Yeah, yeah, he's got the mustache. Yeah, yeah. And he was on, and he went long cooking. And so they tried to cut my cocktail section short. I was like, no. And on like live television, I'm like, no. Massimo got to do his things, I'm doing mine. Yeah. <laughs> and sure. I've never been invited back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I like to keep it, I feel like to keep busy, and I, I, I'm doing my 100th episode for Posture very shortly. Oh, man. Um, Jeff Morgan, happen, that happen was to the a, Happen to put a book together? Uh, yeah, I did a book. Yeah. I'm doing my third book right now, too. So that'll be out by April, hopefully. Fingers crossed. So I've actually got a copy in my bag. It's a, it's a colleague of mine. She is making an endeavor, and I just told her that I was seeing you this morning. Um, so I'll get you to sign it before we go. She's making an endeavor to either through other colleagues or herself, ideally find everybody who's in the book and have them that's sign That's what I love book. about it. Yeah. That's, that's what I want. Like, talk to our culture for here in Victoria. Like, all, most of the bartenders show up to launch. So there's people out there who have a signature from every bartender so great. in cocktail culture. Yeah. Um, and I'm already working on the second edition of that just because it, obviously you go to the cities and you're like, oh man, I forgot about you. Oh man, like... And not even forgot about you, but hopefully in two years there's someone new and exciting. Yeah. You know, and so many of our cities are so diverse that hopefully there's folks coming from Australia or the UK or wherever it is and bringing some new influences and some exciting 150 bartenders right now I think the next issue will probably have 250 so I've got a notepad in my book in my bag that I carry around with me so whenever I go to another studio and I meet another bartender I'm like oh what's your name da, 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 where he works that sort of thing yeah. um, I didn't hit Ottawa at all like and I hear cool Ottawa's little scene yeah I hear Ottawa's great, sort of building out great things happening in Edmonton yeah. and you know you know James very well but um, they're a great example, which I think the, both the big West Coast markets are as well. They're a phenomenal example of a high tide raising all ships and yeah. them being very community minded. To get into some of the larger markets, and you know, in any line of business, they become a product of their surroundings, and therefore, you know, they're. And I also love when the the senior guys stay in town, like Shane Behan in Halifax. Yeah. Never worked anywhere else. Loves Halifax and and an and advocate yeah. for all things Halifax, yeah. not just the cocktail community. And, and same thing with James. Like he could go and work yeah. in Vancouver easy. He'd get a, he'd get a job in Vancouver in like two seconds. Shit, he could take my job if yeah. he wanted to. <laughs> I've seen him come close. Uh, last year during the regionals for the Manhattan Experience Finals, he just started talking, and I was like, "All right, buddy, pump the brakes." <laughs> and he's doing that again this year. He is. Uh, I know he's already got his content together. He's already been working on. It. He's quite excited. He did very well last year. Um, I. We both, I think, kind of had the sense that he had done very well through the semifinals in uh, in Kentucky. And then you're sort of, I think you get a sense of where you sit in those yeah. top six, because then the top six come on to Manhattan and compete for the finals. Um, and it's kind of a, like, you know, who's having a great day and what are the judges feeling? Because by the time you've paired down thousands of entrants, um, and these judges have now seen you twice do your thing with the same two cocktails... Uh, I really do think like that's when you're now getting into like you know, new sure at all. Um, and and from there, I mean, nobody's a, literally. You know, I'm not talking about little league yeah. baseball, but nobody's a loser. Yeah. Um, 
it's six phenomenal entrants. Yeah, and he's done well every year. Like this year, I think the thing, the big difference with James is that uh, he's a little bit older. He's a little, he's like a more closer to our sort of age sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. But he's only been bartending for a short amount of time, so you always sort of get to a point in your career, age wise, not so much experience wise, that you're like, oh, do I really want to do this go through this again? Because it's a or torment of a time to be able to bang all this out. I think, yeah, I think that he and others become a little more selective and therefore you see a, a, like a genuine level of brand loyalty um, that they're, you know, they're entering things where they're, they're truly passionate about those brands but someone like James, he gets quite cerebral about what he's doing. It's not just this is a phenomenal cocktail and that's when I'm talking about like, this fucker's over here taking my job. Like, the things he genuinely knows about the brand and the history of the place and the process um, it's quite impressive. How long have you been the brand ambassador with, with, with Reserve now? Uh, three years. Is that it? Yeah. So you've been ambassador for five, a while. Five years with Brown Foreman. Okay. Um, the parent company. Yep. First two years on Jack Daniels. That's right. And when we did the, you know, the, the corporate structure interview, they sit you down and they sort of say, well, what's your two, five, and ten year plan? I said, you know, in two years, I'd really love to sort of, with where I've been in my background, I'd love to transition through Jack Daniels into focusing on your super premium American whiskeys and in a national capacity and they kind of looked at me and said well we don't have that role and I said well, that's my two year plan yeah there you go let's <laughs> let's work on that together and here we are um, so and you got the work reserve which is because of the nature of the brands I work on um, they, they gave me the opportunity to come up with my own job title which is uh, so long winded now I regret it um, premium Amer- uh, geez what I'd even have to look at my business card um, <laughs> premium 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 whiskey ambassador, something of that nature. Anyway, it's, it's all North American whiskey, but because of the reality of the Brown Foreman portfolio, yeah. 95% of it's Woodford Reserve. Well, Forrester then is, uh, you know, the, the next big chunk of my time, and we'll, I think we're going to see that grow rather rapidly over the next couple of years. It's a bit of cult whiskey here in Canada. It is. Um, the more we introduce it to market and the more we get to folks who really understand quality, process, history, um, it resonates with everybody. Now it's more just on distribution, um, as we well know, and, and you're gonna, about, you're about to know even better. Um, at times, can be challenging to say to any of the boards, "Hey, we've got this phenomenal product. We know we've got demand for it. To fill that demand, could you bring in an awful lot of supply?" And they say, "Oh, you'd like 400 cases? We'll give you 40." Yeah. Um, so, a bit of a challenge because it's a, one of those sort of. Um, it's also bang for your buck, whiskey too. Oh my god. Thank um, you. Killer. It's wholesale in BC. It's twenty six dollars, yeah. and it's about to go on a three dollar LTO in February. I mean, it's for that price point. It, there's a lot of great American whiskeys yeah. in that price point, and I, I'm not the you know I I drank the Kool Aid. I love Brown Foreman yeah. through and through, but I'm here because I love American whiskey through and through, and and greater than that, I love whiskey through and through and cocktail culture. So when I do my master class this afternoon, I'll spend the first half of it just talking about whiskey and bourbon. There won't be a mention of my brands. Because I'm the, of the opinion that the better you understand whiskey as a category, the better that you understand bourbon as a category, the more likely you are to gravitate towards our brands anyway. Yeah. But the average consumer isn't just drinking from one distillery anymore. They're, you know, they're trying all, all types of I think that's one thing these days that I think people, the brands, uh, over, over uh, give too much credit to the consumer in a bit. Because like back in the day when gin first started blowing up, Simon Ford would do the, a big mass class. And the majority of his conversation was about gin. Yeah. And then it just happened to be about beef eater and Right. You know, and I think a lot of a lot of brand ambassadors and a lot of brands these days just go hammer the tongue into like brand focus, yeah. like we're the best and all that sort of stuff. And without missing out, like some consumers don't know about that much about bourbon whiskey. Even at and it, it is not to discredit anyone at all. No. Um, but even at a whiskey show, you know, yeah, yeah you're here to consume whiskey. But so it, I literally start off every mass class by looking at the room saying so what's whiskey um, yeah 99 out of 100 folks in the room it's a bit of a blank stare like wait hey, what's this guy ask me well where does the word come yeah. from where does the product come from where where can we produce whiskey oh heck anywhere oh you, sorry your, your grandfather's Irish Catholic so you only think it comes from Ireland um, you know and that's kind of my story
story. My last name's Corrigan, so I'm Irish Catholic on one side, Scottish on the other. So I had two very polarizing opinions as to what whiskey was growing up. Um, yeah, but it, it, we're doing ourselves a disservice to just say Hoorah Woodford Reserve, yeah. Hoorah Old Forester, because yes, Hoorah those brands are they're phenomenal. I'm very lucky to do what I do. But again, uh, you know, I think diversity is is key, and it's it shines within our portfolios, but then within the whole category. So, uh, so how do you get you get, how do you get to start? What's your uh, your Taylor Corrigan number one? I like to call it like your origin story. Origin story. Um, Not conception though. Like just yeah. let's, get, let's get past those. Yeah. <laughs> um, working in the restaurant industry. Uh, after high school, I took a year off. I was I was actually my intention was to go into civil engineering. I'd already started cooking. Loved food. Um, I think for um, not to knock anyone in my family, but for a lack of exposure to real quality food growing up, um, and just where we grew up, it wasn't like we, you know, grew up in Milan or you know Paris or somewhere where we were being exposed to. I talk about my mom's cooking all the time. Like people would go, "How do you?" So I didn't mention mom, but yeah, yeah my mom's <laughs> I was not much of a cook. I was the oldest of six, right? And we were all eighteen months. Apart. Prison rules. Oh, big time! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was literally overcooked, yeah, flattened steak, yeah, and yeah. just a big pot of mashed potatoes. Eat as quickly as you can <laughs> so you get your ration. I was the oldest, yeah. so I was uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, so from that, I, I, I quickly fell in love with cooking. Uh, and when I took that year off after high school, I actually came out to Vancouver from just west of Toronto uh, for total change of scenery where I'd grown up that, you know, it was a good place to leave at that stage in my life. Uh, I came out to Vancouver and just fell in love with the Pacific Northwest, the influence of, you know, this being right on the ocean, the mountains, the longer growing season, the attention to local products. Uh, so I was fortunate to fall sort of backwards into some phenomenal restaurants. And in my early 20s was of the mind frame that eventually I would have a restaurant of my own um, and realized I had worked for quite a few people who knew one side of the business or the other and it wasn't to knock them by any means but I was even in my youth the type of person who wanted to know everything about what I was doing so I actually on my days off while I was the junior sous chef at Maine Nam in Vancouver cooking Thai food uh, I asked uh, an old friend of mine Steve DeCruz who was opening a cocktail bar with an ungodly uh, list of classic cocktails that wasn't it? it was, yeah, my learning curve was absurd. Um, yeah, it was called The Genuine Article. It was literally a leather-bound book. Um, nothing to do with ego, I'm sure. Uh, um, and uh, started working for him on my days off. Uh, literally polishing glassware day one just to see you know, the flow of the front of house, the operation of the front of house, but what was happening more importantly behind the cocktail bar. Uh, and it very quickly turned into the realization of, hey, this is, you know, very... Uh, very similar to what was happening in the kitchen in terms of combining beautiful ingredients, making sure they taste, smell, and appear beautiful. Uh, but I had the opportunity to interact with human beings on a regular basis, <laughs> working a little bit less, making a little bit more money, learning new things. Uh, so quickly transitioned from leaving the back house to moving into the front house. Jeez, that'll be 2009. Yeah. Uh, so worked through that year at Corner Suite into 2010 and then shortly we had the Olympics here in Vancouver and then fall that year uh, packed a 26 foot U-Haul and uh, drove east headed back to Toronto uh, which at the time sort of seemed like the land of opportunity Vancouver at the time you know it started to feel a little small in the industry I guess uh, more what I think what more drove that that move uh, was family was getting a little bit older and working in the industry getting from Vancouver to Toronto on a regular basis was just tough. Expensive. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't in a corporate role at the time. Yeah. I didn't have paid vacation. I didn't, you know, um, I don't have the, the luxuries I do now. Um, and I, my sister had two beautiful nieces that seeing them once or twice a year just wasn't enough. So ripped home and uh, knocked on a couple doors, like literally day one. Heck, I, uh, day one in Toronto, I rocked on to Queen West and knocked on Frankie's back door at Bar Chef because at the time in Toronto, I mean, in Canada, he was the place of, like, not necessarily cocktails, but just pushing boundaries. People were talking about what's happening here. I conveniently had a molecular background in having worked for Angus Ann at Gastropod, uh, and now with this crazy steep learning curve of classic cocktails working for Steve DeCruz I said hey I think I'm the guy who can sort of put two pieces of what I've got together and, and bring a lot to what you're doing 
he looked me in the eyes and said, awesome, uh, I don't need anybody. <laughs> and so that didn't work out at all, but he quite quickly said, you know, I think my buddy Claudio, who's got the top restaurant in the city right now, might need someone. Um, and that was Origin at King & Church back in the day. Uh, he had just been named Best New Restaurant in Toronto, was the hot spot. Uh, fortunate enough to get an interview in there. And uh, started working there rather immediately. Uh, shortly thereafter, became the bar manager and quite quickly got woven into the Toronto cocktail scene. Uh, which was really growing at the time. Toronto cocktail scene, right as I came into Toronto, uh, it was really convenient timing. It was just emerging. It was just being really, I think, influenced by what was happening in Vancouver, what was happening in Montreal, and then bringing their own you know, flavor. Yeah. Um, so I was able to really be quite involved outside of the likes of Frankie and Dave and Jen Egg, who were at the forefront of the Toronto cocktail scene, that sort of second wave. I was uh, really fortunate to be a part of that, get involved in cocktail competitions, brand work here and there. Um, was able and fortunate to make some friends in the industry on the sales side of things who then once these brand roles started coming up, I mean five, ten years ago, brand roles, you know, in terms of, you know, ambassadors, they were few and far between. Uh, and uh, was fortunate enough that actually uh, another portfolio reached out to me and asked if I wanted uh, to help out launching a beautiful gin brand from Isla, Scotland. Not that I'll name other names right now, but uh, had a beautiful year working on that product, and as they were transitioning to another portfolio, Brown Foreman was starting to look at this world of ambassadorship, and uh, sort of perfect timing for both of us, we kind of both swiped right at the same time, I guess, and um, they uh, they reached out and said, hey, you know, we're looking at uh, building some things with Jack Daniels, um, and heck, at that stage of my career, was so laser-focused in cocktail but then looking at the opportunity of saying hey, going to work for a company of this nature that really is a, a family run business even though it's so multinational and publicly traded uh, and working for the single biggest whiskey in the world that's been made the same way for you know, 150 odd years it was the perfect opportunity um, and as I you know already said then them being aware of my goals of transitioning into their premium whiskeys of being excited about Woodford and Old Forester and then our Canadian whiskeys in Colorado with Canadian whiskey as well. Um, it's been five years now of, uh, you know, continued personal and professional growth and uh, great joy, man. Great joy. Nice. Yeah. So, um, is this your, have you done Whiskey Fest before? I have. Uh, is this your first masterclass or you did a no, masterclass before? No, no. I did a masterclass last year on my own. Um, did a whole bunch of really the influence on North American whiskey last year because mm-hmm. um, I love to f- talk about you know we've got beautiful rye whiskeys at Woodford Reserve and Old Forester now well we come north of the 49th parallel and we say rye whiskey oh, yeah. most of our consumers are thinking ooh Canadian blended whiskey yeah. you know, that's an interesting misconception of how um, I just interviewed Dr. Don right <laughs> um, and what beautiful whiskey there is coming out of Canada but what a wide world of whiskey yeah. there is in Canada I mean heck just down the road Victoria County Caledonian Distillery, they, you know, they're making beautiful Irish style of whiskeys and beautiful single malt style of whiskeys. Um, so I always sort of say we're kind of the Wild West up here. Uh, I would jokingly say that in Canada, you know, we, I, you know, we kind of lack a bit of regulation around our whiskey in terms of the different styles. Uh, whereas we regulate our guns quite aggressively, and then in the U.S., we're quite aggressive about regulating our whiskeys, and uh, you know, they might be a little bit looser on the guns. How, how, when you do whiskey fests like this, where the demographic is somewhat older yeah how do you connect with as a, as a younger like I get a cocktail festivals and stuff like that of course your your buddies are all there it's easy yeah. to connect with the, high fives all over oh, the place yeah, yeah. Um, how do you connect with uh, people who come in to whiskey fest who usually drink single malts yeah and who, so laser focused yeah and then older easy older upper class easy. white males um, conversation ask them yeah. what they like like any consumer get to know them understand what their likes are and understand them and say hey, I've got a table of eight whiskeys here because the number of times that a quote-unquote traditional single malt drinker comes to my table and I can see them. They, they're, they're beelining towards me from 15 feet away to say, I don't like bourbon. <laughs> and that's quite fine. We all have to, you know, we all have different tastes. I always say different strokes for different folks, but then I immediately say, hey, that's quite all right. We all have different, you know, we, we, we smell differently, we taste differently, we 
we feel differently, that depends on the time of day, the weather, what we're eating. But I said, what do you like? Let's talk about that. Let me, let me understand what you do like. And when I hear them out, all of a sudden I can find one of our whiskeys that tickles, you know, that... Just whether, something. Sure, whether it's that part of the palate or yeah. it's the story of the production or, you know, we're so lucky with Woodford Reserve with the, you know, the production process we go through that, you know, whether it's Scottish or Irish influence, we're able to find some of that in our production method. So even when you can tie that to the story for them and have them dig a little bit deeper and at least take the time to appreciate the product, um, heck, that that for me is is the greatest joy. I don't need to pour Woodford for someone who already loves Woodford. Yeah. Um, it, that's great. And that's, you know, helping people. I always say, uh, I sell single malt, but I drink bourbon. Sure. And that's like, I've always had massive single malt lists. Yeah. Big bourbon lists. But like, yeah. for me, I drink at the end of the night. It's a beer and a bourbon. Right. And the, I think that to the credit of the Brown Foreman portfolio as well, anytime someone's like, oh, you know, Brown Foreman American Whiskey, I said, well, we, we happen to own three beautiful single malt distilleries and we just finished building an Irish distillery as well. So we've got something for everyone. Um, and that's why, you know, when I do the master classes, I love to do a wide range of our North American whiskeys to really help folks understand that okay, Canadian whiskey is not just one thing. Bourbon is not just one thing. And now this new exciting growth in American rye and heck, as you well know, what we're doing at Woodford Reserve down south, you know, we've got malt whiskey, we've got wheat whiskey. What we're doing with master's collections and Woodford Reserve as distillers, we're not a brand that are just putting product out to saturate the market. Shelf spam. No, because heck, you know, we look at it as um, we need to be careful because we don't want to we don't, we don't want to cannibalize our own shelf yeah. space. But we're so excited about this growth of whiskey categories, and we know that we understand the science of you know fermentation, distillation, and aging. So why can't we be great at all these styles of whiskey and not just you know what we are known for, which is our Kentucky Straight Bourbon? So heck, if someone comes up to me and says, "I you know I only drank aggressively peated single malts from Isle of Scotland," I say, "Hey, that's beauty. You know, I love them too." But let's talk about why you like that yeah. and drill into it and find something here that's. Yeah, well, I, I did a tasting yesterday with uh, Gez from Brickladdy, mm-hmm. and uh, it's very interesting. Love how, the brand, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting when um, the same people who geek out about they only drink 18-year-old single malts also go hard geek out on Optimal, right? and you're like, oh, well, it's three years old. Like, right. <laughs> so the, the number of times those same consumers, and, and let's not, uh, you know, I don't want to put anyone in a corner, um, but the number of times that a consumer will come up to me and say, hey, which one's your oldest? Yeah. And my response to that is always, why? And and because, you know, whether it be marketing or whether it be the nature of aging, you know, over the pond um, and how those age statements have been, you know, quite closely tied to the success of quite a few brands, my response then becomes, hey, look, if you put a poorly made whiskey into a poorly made barrel for a very long period of time, well, you've got an old shitty whiskey, <laughs> but you're going to have to pay a lot of money for it yeah. because time's money. Yeah. Um, you know, then help... Then to help understand the consumer how a in the U.S., whether we're talking bourbon, straight rye, or Tennessee whiskey, we're aging our whiskey in virgin oak, so we're getting dramatic, dramatically different influence from our barrel. Uh, also, we're getting a great deal of interaction much more rapidly. It gets very hot in the summer in Kentucky and quite cold in the winter, whereas beautiful sunny Scotland, uh, not a great deal of fluctuation in temperature. Yeah. So our aging cycles, you know, we're getting, yeah, for one year in Kentucky, we've proven that it's, it would take three to four years in Scotland to get the same thing out of the exact same barrel that we've produced at our cooperages. So uh, then again, I can say, hey, look, we now will tell you that Woodford Reserve is aged an average of 7.2 years because some of you love numbers so much, yeah. but some of it's just over four years. Some of it might be up to 10, and that really does depend on the temperature cycling, the external climate, um, and we'd be doing ourselves a disservice to put 10 years old on that whiskey because climate is changing. Yeah. So 20 years from now, if we were to age Woodford Reserve for 10 years, it would be quite different than yeah, it is right is now. Awesome. And we would just be doing that for the sake of having a number 10 on that bottle, whereas we're more interested in consistency of that character and quality. As a brand ambassador, you, do you travel a lot? Are you just in Canada or do you look after the US as well? No, just in Canada. I, When I'm fortunate enough that beautiful humans like James Grant and Chris Enns get to the <laughs> Woodford Reserve <laughs> Manhattan Experience Finals, uh, I down. get to trot down to Manhattan and carry their bag around and make sure they have the bitters they need and whatever else it may be that they forgot. Um, so that's a great joy. Uh, and then obviously taking consumers, but more importantly, 
folks uh, like our trade partners, whether it be retail or on-premise, down to our distilleries, uh, whether it be our new facility at Old Forester right in downtown Louisville, mm-hmm. our Cooperages in Louisville, um, or the Woodford Reserve Distillery in Versailles, Kentucky, getting down there to really show them. Um, you know, I can talk for days and tell you these stories and show you the odd PowerPoint <laughs> presentation. See, see is tangible. Oh, but living it, um, living it and breathing it is, is, as you well know, just something far different. Um, and people come back as, as advocates for the brand. So, a bit of that travel. Um, otherwise, here in Canada, because of the nature of the brand, in the Canadian marketplace. Majority of my time in and around Toronto. And then Vancouver really is um, trending as the you know second sort of most important market for super premium American whiskey. Um, really based on what's happening in the cocktail scene, but then also affluent demographic with money to spend on you know, quality product. Uh, and then, you know, I'll go anywhere and everywhere. Heck, I'm, I'm happy to go to Sault Ste. Marie in northern Ontario if there's something phenomenal happening. Um, last summer, heck, I worked Jazz Fest in Sudbury, Ontario. Oh, and nice. it was incredible. And it's not somewhere you would think, yeah. you know, historically is this bourbon culture, yeah. culture or even jazz culture. Uh, but they, you know, you get to those smaller communities and they really, really embrace what yeah. you're doing. They they know you're coming from the outside and what you're bringing. So they get so excited about it. Um, obviously, those Haligonians and the anyone out in the Atlantic are doing phenomenal things. Um, Montreal is always going to be that crazy high energy and, and just such a great deal of pride in their food and drink scene. Um Prairies, great to see how much is happening out there. So, great deal of travel, um, but fortunate that really, as I like to say, I'm maturing, just like our whiskey, not getting any older. How, but how do you uh, keep up with the schedule? Like, how do you like health wise? I know, like, to this morning you're like, I got a yoga class at eight yeah. in the morning. You've been to yeah. Victoria once in like the last year. It's like, yeah. How do you how do you stay fit on the road? That's like, it. Um, I I always so I live and die by my calendar, yep. um, as as I think anyone and everyone should. Um, no, that's not the case for everybody. I really but, wish every bartender would. Yeah. yeah um, heck, we're all different. We're all different <laughs> strengths. Um, for me, it's about committing to work and, and understanding what my work obligations are, but putting my personal time first and foremost and building around my personal time professionally. Because even if I'm here or Vancouver or Calgary, Alberta, the first thing I do when I look at where I'm traveling is, hey, where's the nearest hot yoga studio and what's their schedule like? Because genuinely, that that practice for me um, has become as much physical, uh, get a good sweat on, get a good stretch on, but also quite mental, emotional, and spiritual. Um, so that mad time for an hour, and it's amazing. You know, last night I was out for, I had a great time out with a whole bunch of colleagues and folks, but at 10 o'clock I said, oh, you know, guys, uh, have a great night. I'm not missing anything after 10 o'clock at night. No. No? Um, <laughs> no. Um, so, you know, that balance, and then also just being able to realize, like, you know, I through my 20s, and, and in my early 30s, man, I've, I've had more fun than, than most people you'll meet. Um, but after the likes of 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I'm not missing anything. Yeah. Um, we're still going to have a few laughs, but I'm going to get back to my hotel room and, and read a book uh, and then get up early and go take yoga practice. Uh, when I'm home, I hike a load with my dog. Um, and last week, you'll like this one, after a 15-year hiatus, I went to my first rugby training session. Uh, so I'm looking at uh, getting back into rugby this year, but... As active as possible, but but balanced in all regards. Um, I'm studying school right now as well. I'm taking some strategic marketing courses nice. through Ryerson University. Um, so little bits of everything. Um, you know, also on the flip of all that, reminding myself that downtime is okay and it's a good thing. Uh, I love to be busy. You know, uh, I love to be productive. I love to learn and experience new things. But heck, every once in a while, you also just got to shut it down. Um, I got to stop doing that. Ball. Yeah. Um, so, living and dying by that calendar, um, enjoying life, uh, appreciating the fact that it's short and sweet, and uh, getting as much out of it as possible, man. What are you excited about for 2020? Oh, heck. Um, professionally, 2020, the continued growth of our portfolio. Uh, we obviously... In the Canadian marketplace, we've experienced a great shift in the last year and a half, two years to working with a new agency with a very broad portfolio that is very, very complementary to ours. So we're basically partnered with William Grant's and Sons now here in Canada. And you look at how the Brown Foreman portfolio and William Grant's complement each other. So very exciting. And now we have such a dynamic team and it's just that much larger in Canada. So continued opportunity. 
the great thing with Woodford Reserve, where I spend the majority of my life, is we know where our brand lives and we know what we're focused on, which is really the cocktail and culinary world. Mm -hmm. It's not a brand where we're trying to establish ourselves or figure ourselves out. So, you know, it's not, oh, we're going a totally different direction this year. Um, So that consistency is lovely. And to be able to build on established success is so great. Um, And then personally, just continuing to grow, you know, learning new things, experiencing new things, meeting great people, having fun while I'm doing it. Um, And heck, I guess most immediately, next week I'm taking vacation. I'm going skiing for a week with my sister and her family. So That's where you go. Uh, just south of Montreal, down into Vermont. Uh, okay. Yeah, I rented a chalet just outside of Stowe. And uh, honestly, my work phone doesn't even get cell service in the States. So I can, like, legitimately shut off for a week. Um, not that I, I won't find a way to check emails, I'm sure, once or twice. Because um, you kind of avoid that anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how close am I to the border? Um, but yeah, just, you know, taking that time again to shut off. It was, it's funny, when I first started in this world, I was the kid who was guilty of, hey, you got a few weeks of paid vacation, and by the end of the year, it's like, oh, I haven't used any of this vacation. Um, so now I'm very mindful of looking at the whole year, planning the year out, um, personally and professionally. Uh, so it's going to be a great year. Uh, awesome. Lots of fun things. I think on that note, that's a great end to the podcast. Cool. It's a great episode. Great. Appreciate thanks it, Thanks so much for sitting down for God. Yeah, thanks, Sean. I'm going to make hay when the sun shines right now. Love it. Thanks, Boo Shifters. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, if you're listening, whatever platform you're on, give me a good rating, subscribe, listen along. Uh, I'm going to keep going. I really enjoy sitting down with people and learning where they're from, what they did, and how they got to where they were. So if you love it, give me a good five stars. If you don't, give me one and I'll try harder.